Hi, my name is Sun Yu. I'm a student in the Robot Design Lab in the Mechanical Science and Engineering Department at the University of Illinois. Today, I will share with you about our recent work on humanoid robot teleoperation. Here is the table of contents of my presentation. First, I will begin with the background and motivation. Then, I will introduce a system we studied and the experiment with which we studied the system. Lastly, I will present and discuss about the experimental results and answer your questions. As a disclaimer before we start, please hold your questions until the Q&A section, if possible, due to the time constraint of this presentation. I appreciate your understanding and cooperation. Now let's begin with the background and motivation. Our lab's aim is to dynamically teleoperate humanoid robots. Why teleoperation? Because teleoperation can harness human planning intelligence to enable machines to achieve sophisticated tasks that current autonomous machines cannot. As a benefit of the human planning intelligence harnessed, teleoperation has the potential to enable very dynamic motions of humanoid robots. More specifically, our lab has an ongoing project on disaster response or application. In this project, we aim to use a human pilot and a human machine interface to teleoperate a humanoid robot to perform very dynamic tasks, such as using a heavy object to slam a door, rescuing a human, and throwing a heavy object. These tasks involve dynamic arm movement. So a natural question to ask is, which of the two most obvious mappings for arm teleoperation will be better at these tasks, joint space or task space mapping? Since the system consists of a human and a machine, it is challenging to analyze the system purely in theory or simulation. So we chose to seek the answer experimentally. Now I will introduce the teleoperation system we studied. The teleoperation system has two subsystems, the motion capture linkage, which captures the human's arm movements, and the robotic arm, which executes the human arm movements captured. Here is the information flow diagram of the teleoperation system. On the two ends, we have the human arm with linkage and the robotic arm. These are the actual hardware systems. In the middle, we have the topological arms, which are the reduced models that encode the core kinematic features of the two hardware systems. The teleoperation occurs at the theta command term in between. So joint space mapping is straightforward to implement. We simply set the commanded joint positions equal to the whole human topological arms joint position. For task space mapping, we chose an approximate approach. For guarantee of visibility of commanded trajectories, we joint space teleoperated the first two joints and task space teleoperated the last two joints in a plane formed by the topological arm's upper arm and forearm, where the arm is simply a planner to degree of freedom manipulator. Now we will look at experimental design. The experiment's objective is to quantify and compare the teleoperation system's dynamic performances under different conditions. The method we chose was the Bartek test, which quantifies dynamic performance as reaction time. The Bartek test is a standard reaction test in a wide spectrum of sports, especially in motor racing. Since the teleoperation system also contains a human and a machine, we thought that the Bartek test would be appropriate. Here is a video demonstrating the Bartek test. Inspired by the Bartek test, we built this experimental setup. The human pilot sits behind the robot, which is smaller than a human. In front of the robot is an array of six targets, arranged in normalized distances by the robot's arm length. The experiment centers on three tests. They are sequential striking test, single target reaction test, and multi-target reaction test. In a trial of sequential striking test, the subject will hit the top three targets from left to right, and then the bottom three from right to left as fast as possible. The time between two adjacent hits is recorded, producing five reaction times per trial. Now let's see the test in action. In a trial of single target reaction test, the top middle target lights up at a random time between 0.5 and 1 second, and the subject will teleoperate the robot to hit the target as fast as possible after it lights up. 
The subject also knows that only the top middle target will light up, and the trial contains 10 hits, hence 10 reaction times. A trial of multi-target reaction test is the same as a trial of single-target reaction test, except that a random target lights up. With the three tests, we formed a testing sequence. First, we begin with sequential striking test, then, then single target reaction, and lastly, multi target reaction. We recruited six consented human subjects to form two comparison groups of three subjects. All the subjects were male, and the mean age was about 24 years. Another thing to pay attention to is that all subjects have their arm, forearm longer than their upper arms, while the robot has its forearm shorter than its upper arm. So the subjects and the robot have different link length ratios. One of the comparison groups started with joint space mapping and then task space, while the other group had the opposite order of mappings. Additionally, every subject was provided with sufficient time to practice the target operation, but only in sequential striking test. There was no intermission within a testing sequence, and the subject did not know which mapping was active. Per subject time consumption for this experiment was between three and six hours. So this was a quite strenuous and time consuming experiment. Meanwhile, every subject also performed the same testing sequence without target operation. Now let's see the experimental results and discuss about them. The most important result from this, ex this experiment is the stable mean reaction time. Stable here means that these reaction times were obtained after the subjects adapted to the target operation. Adaptation means that a, subject, a subject's per trial mean reaction times and standard deviation decrease as a subject performs more trials. On the legend, H means that the results were obtained when the subject performed the tests by him or herself. HL means that the subject or the motion capture linkage to perform the tests but without target operation. As we see, for sequential striking tests, the stable mean reaction times vary among subjects. For single target reaction tests, the results were not only similar between joint and task space mappings, but also similar between the humans and the robot. For multi target reaction tests, the robot performed more slowly than the humans, but joint and task space mappings also yielded similar reaction times. Hence, we can have the following observations. First, all subjects adapted to both mappings after, after sufficient practice. Second, the two mappings yielded similar stable mean reaction times after the adaptation. Despite the similar stable mean reaction times, the two mappings produce different results in adaptation trends. Shown here are two subjects per trial mean reaction times in the first 10 second 10, and last 10 trials of sequential striking test. Remember that no subject had teleoperated the robot before the first 10 trials, and all subjects were adapted to the teleoperation in the last 10 trials. Subject 2 began with joint space mapping and then task space, while subject 5 had the opposite order of mappings. As we see, subject 2 gradually adapted to the mapping the subject started with, and upon transition to task space mapping, subject two appeared to be already adapted. But this phenomenon did not occur to subject five. Similar trends can also be observed on other subjects. Hence, we can deduce that in terms of the ease of adaptation, task space, ma task space mapping is better. Lastly, we will look at the non-dimensional n defector trajectories. Shown here are the humans and the robots n defector trajectories in every testing combination where motion capture was available. All the trajectories were normalized by their respective arm length, so they can be put on the same scale. We can observe two features on this collection of plots. 
First, the humans moved differently when they were teleoperating the robot than, with, than when they were not teleoperating for both mappings. This implies that the teleoperation was unintuitive. Second, the human's trajectories from task space mapping were still more similar with the human's traje trajectories without teleoperation, as they are less curvy and less chaotic than the human's trajectories from joint space mapping. We now summarize the conclusions. First, all subjects adapted to both mappings after sufficient practice. Second, the humans and the robot achieve similar single target reaction times after the adaptation. These results were obtained even though the humans and the robot have different weak lens ratios and that the teleoperation was unintuitive. Next, task, task space mapping was easier to adapt to than joint space mapping, and task space mapping yielded more similar human trajectories with the human trajectories without teleoperation. Therefore, we conclude that for our dynamic humanoid robot, we should choose task space mapping for arm tire operation. Thank you for attending my presentation. Please read our paper if you're interested in more details of our study. And please ask your questions now.